Sometimes to settle? Uh, so we use this. We are now going to our second part of the program. And because we are short of time, I will take this opportunity to invite our Vice Chancellor, Prof, to actually call upon our plenary speaker. Thank you, Dr. Amos Omamo. Enhancing partnership for industry-led vocational training and education in horticulture is a project that we have been running for the last uh, almost three years. And when this conference came, we had also planned as a group, the team that was assembled here this morning, to have our closing day today. And we quickly discussed with the team, and we agreed that we can be part and parcel of the conference, the pre-conference day. And then we did discuss that if the, the team can donate a keynote speaker, really to speak on what these things are all about, because what we have been doing the last three years almost mimic one of the themes that we have in this conference. And so we settled on our technical coordinator from Netherlands, Madam Dr. Irene. Irene, sorry, you prefer, you see, prefer Irene, not Irene. <laughs> sorry, ma'am. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, this, this afternoon, um, Irene is going to give a, um, a presentation on what we have been doing but also it's very relevant to what we are doing, one of the themes we are dealing with in our this inaugural international conference. So Madam Irene, please, you can come. As I said earlier, I'm the project director. I don't feel small, Irene. The, she works under me, together with the Professor Masinde. And I'm very, I must tell you that I'm very, very happy who have worked with them the last three years. Thank you, Madam Irene. Please, can you clap for us? Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I'm honored to work under you. Uh, now, I hope the technique is going to work because I have to do things through Zoom as well. So. Yeah, that's really brilliant. Thank you, it's really nice to be here and stand here and f I feel very honored that we as the EPIFET team, because we are a rather large team, uh, can present here uh, what we've been doing over the last three years. And I was uh, just talking to my colleagues, we were so impressed when we had the whole group here this morning standing in front, because you don't realize, because, because we had of course, the COVID, you all know we had to go online. So working between Kenya and the Netherlands, everything had to go via Zoom, had to be online. But I think we managed very well. You know, I think the, the real sort of proof of it that is that we are all here. Okay, this is the very long name. We call it ePivot. Yeah, and it pivots around sort of learning and about capacity development and around horticulture. And I see my colleague, uh, Prof. Songas, because he was instigative of this name. And I thought, Prof, I think you were reading it, yeah, because I always have to read it. Enhancing partnership for industry-led vocational training and education for water smart and climate-proof horticulture. There are actually two projects. One is really on horticulture, focusing how do we produce, how do we really get uh, further with horticulture, which has a lot of opportunities. But we all know if we don't have water and with the climate changing, if we don't respond, uh, it won't help. Okay, now this is a lot of name. It's a huge collaboration. Uh, we saw the six different colleges here. 
which are sort of coordinated by Mero University of Science and Technology, who also does bachelor students are part of it. Uh, we have Ahero, Siala, Taraka, Meru National Polytechnic, Marimba and Kenya Water Institute. Or some kind of vocational training at different levels. And especially for us from the Netherlands, it's taken us a while to get used to if it's an artisan level or a craft or whatever level you are at. But I think it's a really good system that students can grow. And from starting, they can end up with a master's here at MUST or at another university. But also in the Netherlands, uh, it's one of the ambitions of the Dutch government uh, that also, they call them the green universities, those that work in agriculture and environment are working together. So also from outside, we have four universities. And some universities do everything from has sort of the more certificate level up to the master level. Um, and an institute that I come from, Wageningen University, we basically train bachelors, masters and PhDs. And so it's all different types of education working together. But you can do it as education institute yourself, but if you don't anchor yourself in the sector, and in the sector at this, I mean the horticulture sector, the water sector, the climate sector, you have to work with people outside. Because if you train graduates, it's with effort level, they come to go for employment. And we hear so often here, but also in the Netherlands, that graduates come out of school and the employers say, oh, we have to completely retrain them. It's taken us half a year to retrain them. And we don't want to happen. We really want to capacitate uh, our young people so they can really go into the labor market and find employment or become entrepreneurs and really make a business for themselves. So uh, in Kenya, we worked with the Horticulture Development Council, uh, so the public sector, also very important. They absorb a lot of people, but they know a lot about horticulture and how to work for export. We worked with trade care, private sector, uh, Joyce, a self-made woman, yeah? a good example of how you can actually be an entrepreneur and grow and really make a change in the sector. We work with the Water Resource Authority, they are here as well, and they train uh, water users, research, uh, resource associations, yeah? and all the type of capacity development that farmers and water users actually need yeah, they need also to be aware of climate change. They need to be aware of water, how to deal with water. Uh, Caro has also been a partner, a bit at a distance, but they also been partnering with the colleges. We've been there. And FBIC, as the Fresh Producers Export Association, is there as well. So you can see here in Kenya, we have this whole network of partners we work more closely with and partners we work less closely with. But also in the Netherlands, especially on the water and climate, um, and because the team from the universities was very much experts in horticulture, but it doesn't mean we are experts in climate or we are experts in water. So we looked for the partners that could help us. And there is a World Water Net. But Water Net is actually, it's the, it's the water suppliers in the Netherlands. They have an international program. And here in Kenya, they work a lot with the water basins around the Tika. So sort of how can you sort of be sensible with, with the water uh, that's happening here? So they work very closely with WRA. And we have the climate adaptation services. And I'll show you in a minute what we have been doing with them. They ma make very, they make maps and they look, yeah, because we often talk about the climate is changing it's often the weather is changing. And the climate is our long term, it's our 30 years, and our 50 years, and it's changing much faster than we expected. But we have to also look into the future, what's going to happen, and would something like horticulture still have a future? Okay, but why should we focus on horticulture? Because you also have agriculture, and we need to feed all these people. Have food security is a very important one. Of course, for the Netherlands, and I'm looking at uh, the representative of the embassy, horticulture in the Netherlands is really, you know, 
it's sort of, uh, it's not even farming anymore. It's factory farming, I always call. If you go to the greenhouses in the Netherlands where we produce tomatoes, they're like tomato factories. Hey, but horticulture is one of our fields of expertise. Hey, so many uh, Dutch embassies in various countries, they really focus on horticulture as one of the, hey, that's where we can sort of, as the Netherlands, uh, support other countries. But why is it really important for countries like Kenya? We have rapid population growth and urbanization. And uh, population growth, that immediately means there is less land to farm on, especially highly densely populated areas. Farmers, the land is split up, the urbanization is encroaching on uh, the farmland, but horticulture, you can actually do at a very small piece of land. Urbanization as well. Very urban agriculture. Have middle class people in the cities, they want to eat fresh vegetables. It's a very good income generation uh, option. And so you can actually sort of, uh, uh, you don't need to produce lots of maize on a big field. You can produce on a small area lots of uh, sukamariki, your uh, Swiss chard, your tomatoes. You don't need much. I already mentioned the middle class, and you see it here in Kenya as well. Hey, you have these beautiful health shops. People are much more focused on health. And I think also the COVID pandemic, hey, people are very aware of it. If I have an unhealthy lifestyle, maybe I'm more susceptible to, uh, to diseases that come. Hey, so people, especially the middle class, is more aware of it. And once also the traditional vegetables produced here in Kenya. Uh, that's the health benefit, absolutely. And um, yeah, we need to supplement our starchy diet and our fatty diet with vegetables. It's a real opportunity for growth. Economic growth, but also other growth. And not only export, because so often we talk about export when we talk horticulture. It's the French beans that go to, often to the Netherlands through the auctions. It's the big flower producers here. Um, but if you look at the domestic market, you've got a huge um, clients, consumers, whatever you call them, that can buy. And so it really sort of think more domestic market than export market, because that is where the com uh, opportunities are. Processing and service delivery. Now it's often we look at the producers, but there's many of jobs opportunities for the processing. Have we all know we all sort of working people. It's so nice if you can go to a supermarket or to the fresh market and somebody has chopped your vegetables already. Or you, make, you buy a ready mixed salad. And so also for youngsters, it's very important. It's not about laboring in the field, but it's really about where are the job opportunities further up the stream. But also management of natural resources. If you do proper irrigation, for instance, you can really use much less water than you actually would do if you have maize that is withering in the sun. Yesterday we went to Taraka, the area, and it's so dry at the moment, and you see some farmers actually irrigating. That's sort of, that's not the best use of water, yeah? And of course, they need to look after the food security. But if we can really think how can we use our few natural resources more optimally, yeah, we can really produce something. And the advantage, if you have good conditions, it's year round. Yeah? It's not the income that goes up because you have one season, but uh, you can produce year round. And farmers will also have a year round income. Okay, look a bit at the food system, how they relate to the sustainable development goals, because that's also one of the uh, topics of this conference. Um, because we need healthy diets, and I already mentioned it, the type of diet uh, that we are moving to, call it the Western diet, huh? Kentucky, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, lovely. But what does it add to our health and our sort of our benefits? And so if we can really have a diverse diet with the different type of vegetables supplementing, that would be great. Income generation, especially for women. Hey, you see a lot of young women that uh, are more in the service industry, working in the hospitality, but there are plenty of opportunities for women in 
like I mentioned, the processing already, but also in the advice around horticulture. So it's really one we should have to really look out for. Economic growth I already mentioned. We need to look at climate resilient agriculture. And that's horticulture, but that's also wider. But horticulture is a very good vehicle how we can make that change. And one of the things which you often miss is sort of that collaborative action. That is FPEAK, who is there for the producers association. But on a local, on a more sort of horticulture level, there is not a very good representation at the moment. The sector is very fragmented. Uh, we've been as a trip also to some avocado farmers. Brilliant, they were organized. They had 600 members, I think, of which a third women fam farmers. Huh? They are really, that's how you need to go, because they wanted to export. And if you don't organize yourself, Hey, you're at, the, at the, the hands of the middleman, and your income will really go down. So that's my promotion for horticulture, so I hope you agree with that. Um, as the Netherlands, but also as Wageningen University and also the other institutes, we've been engaged with uh, horticulture in Kenya for a long time. We have partners we've been working with. So this is an example from uh, a different project, the 3R project, we really did an assessment of the whole horticulture sector. It's now a few years old, but it's still quite relevant because a lot of the issues we haven't solved yet. And from that project, we looked at climate change is an important factor, but also food safety. Because we all know that in horticultural crops, we all seen these people with the knapsack spraying, and of course, you spray your tomatoes just before harvest because then they stay on the shelf better. That's good for the farmer, maybe good for the person selling them. It's not good for our own health. Hey, so it's things like that, and those issues that the students and the our experts of tomorrow need to be aware of. We also did some work on... Um, and this is the bit where we go with water and climate resilient horticulture, but how do you do that? On the left you see the picture where we actually looked at the climate atlas. And that's with, uh, we did that with JQAT and the climate adaptation services. Because the farmers were asking, yes, but how is the climate changing in my area? Because of course we have a lot of climate expertise. And here you see it, it's the whole map of Kenya. But what we did is translate that climate change uh, projections. Right? We, it, it's all a lot of uncertainty. How can you actually focus that on certain areas? And then you have the area. But I grow tomatoes, you grow kale, and somebody else grows maize and sorghum. So what does it mean for me? So then we actually made uh, sort of user stories where you, you can't see it from where you are, but it shows the red bars are the projection in 30 years' time. The dotted line is the optimal of the temperature for tomatoes. So if it goes above that, it means your tomato production goes down. Hey, so it's helping farmers, but also extension workers. How can we work with farmers? How we can we work with the system? to make it all climate proof. But we need to understand, and we need to understand it at the level that you communicate, and not what the, uh, the climate experts, they have to be there. But how do we translate that to the people? On the right is a map we just saw yesterday, it's from Kiwi. It's where students are looking at water uh, catchment, have water harvesting, because we all know it, once it rains, the water runs off and it disappears. It's such a simple thing. Eh? Harvest your water and you have it at another time. And these students had very practical exercises. How do we design that? How do we put that into this very dry environment? Because we were at a place where you said harvesting rain. I mean, I mean, it was as dry as everything. But that is when it's important. Because if you don't harvest it when it rains, it is absolutely gone. Okay, but why are we doing this? We really work towards capacitating the use, capacitating 
you as a, if you're a trainer or a teacher, it's about real hands-on um, teaching. And not sort of your classroom teaching, what I'm doing now to you, but really sort of getting the students out there. And these are some pictures we took in the last few days. It's really about the future, about getting education for horticulture, but also hopefully for other topics, which is much more geared to problem solving. This morning we had a student from uh, uh, Marimba College, diploma student. He was saying, I love it, this problem-based learning, because it was a real problem. He had sort of, they had a problem with the tomatoes. They phoned the experts, they searched the internet, and they sorted it themselves. They learned much more than while you are listening to me when I'm talking like this. Yeah, so it's really that problem-based learning that we also changing to in the Netherlands. We can still improve, and you see the movement here as well. And we're really learning from each other between the Dutch institutes and the Kenyan institutes. At this point, I want to leave it. We come to do a lot of work still in our EPIFIT project, and for the whole of the partnership, we hope it's not the end, that it's really a start for the students and, and the future of education and horticulture, in particular in Kenya. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rene. Let's appreciate her better. So at this moment, I don't know, we'll have a brief interactive session. Anyone with any question to Irene? And then we are going to do the breakout sessions. Because EPVOT has to go to another forum in the other theaters. And then we are going to remain with the other presenters here. So, I don't know, we will take just about five minutes or so. Yes, that's why we're saying this is an interactive session. Anybody with a comment, any question? Uh, for Irene at this moment. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the good uh, presentation. A very innovative uh, way of uh, uh, bringing a very good uh, collaborative uh, venture with uh, many institutions, both here in Kenya as well as uh, Netherlands. Uh, do we have any um, um, opportunities of uh, other universities that uh, are really doing uh, similar things uh, with Mary University um, uh, coming in on board. Thank you. So that, that was a question or a comment? <laughs> <laughs> or a suggestion, a future, a hopeful... <laughs> Yes, uh, th this project was actually funded by, supported by NUFIC. NUFIC is the Netherlands University Fellowship Fund for International Collaboration. It's a long word. And they do in institutional collaboration as well as um, supporting uh, individual masters or PhDs. Um, it has many more projects in uh, Kenya, and I'm looking at Brenda. It has 14 projects in Kenya. Yeah, so they're all between Dutch uh, and Kenyan in, uh, education institution. At the moment, NUFIC has finished their sort of their, their round. They so have a five-year turnover. So we don't know what the future is going to be, but uh, yeah, we keep on looking for it. Uh, but of course, I can only speak from the Netherlands side because I think the Germans, the I said, have similar programs uh, as well. Yeah. Any other suggestion or comment or question? Maybe. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Irene. Comment. <laughs> I'm a Karanji. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, there is something that I keep on bothering me. Um, I come from Kisi, and they, they say Kisi is the, the God's bathroom. I don't know how it looks like that, but that was, will give you some closer to God's bathroom because it rains almost throughout the year. And, um, but there's some time over the year that um, about two months that um, there is no rain and there is no, no greens. People starve there. I don't have greens. I don't know in Meru, but I think it has a picture across the country that uh, uh, especially food shortages, sorry, greens. Uh, I've been wondering how best to educate and bring in innovation. If we have God's factor of me, water is growing almost more than uh, six months of the year, and then you have no greens. At one time, I think one time somebody was linked for stealing skuma week. Hmm? So, um, I think this is a very promising uh, approach. But culture, because you have the irrigation, water harvesting, how do we how do we support the water harvesting to sustain the growth of vegetables? Uh, because I believe that even COVID spared Africa because they eat, they eat a lot of organic food. Hmm? So their immunity is... So I think... Hmm? How do we connect the message so that those who grow there is know that this is variable and how do we how do we address I think what harvesting is, is great. How do we so those are just I, I'm thinking yeah. even loud. Then. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, like I said yesterday we in Taraka we said because at each of the collaborating um, vocational training centers, they invested in an innovation hub, huh, which has a greenhouse and different types of showing for the area how it can be done. And Taraka, of course, being very dry, they had some really good innovations. You have your tires and you grow vertical. There's very little water and you can basically feed the family. Yeah, and, and, and so it, it's very small things, but it is how do you get them out from these training centers. Yeah, it is, of course, your students who graduate, who go out. But they also, and some better than others, been involving farmers. So the farming from the surroundings coming to this college, showing what innovations they've been experimenting with. And they've been taking them back. And of course, that takes a bit of time, but I think it is really for these colleges going to the communities because we have a lot of technologies, but if they remain sort of within that, have this inside the institutions, uh, yeah, so that, that is what they be me stimulating, and a lot of them been doing as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Kiwi, yeah. The water pan. Yeah. Uh, that even in Kisi, where you come, <coughs> two, three months you don't have water. And you need to use to have rain every day. We are saying that when you have water one of the months of the year, you can actually collect that and then now use it instead of it just going out. So that's one of the things that was emotive. In Netherlands, when I was there, was it a month or two months ago? Two months ago, yeah. yeah. I think they told me now they get ready once in three weeks, and that to them is a very dry period they have never had, and that is your climate change. And they are worried. In Meru here, and I know most of us are in Meru here, 
you not see rain from Denmark. <laughs> so this thing is real. If you go to where I come from, it rains nearly every week. So I also think that even for us, Professor Wasong, I hope you are still here. How come in the lowland, like Mombasa and the Lake Victoria region, and where the chair of academic committee is coming from, it's raining every week. And then in the highland like Kisi, like Meru, we don't have rain. Is it and then what can we do? The technology that are being used, maybe to when there are used to be a lot of rain. Can we now go to places where there's a lot of rain so that we improve the activity there so that if we does here, as we still use the water pipe to collect water whenever we get it? Just now, God bless you. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to add is um, looking at the nexus, that's continuum. Hmm? You have rain, you plant, you harvest. Can you dry, say, vegetables? Both fully for consumption in the future and also for income generation. We happen to be just by the equator. We have a lot of sun. And uh, so we can uh, use Sora to. I'm seeing this. Yep. Nexus. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You can try, but. If you don't consume it, it's not the nicest way to eat, to eat vegetables. But I mean, solar drying is happening. I've been to different places also around Mount Kenya. Hey, they have big solar dryers. But you also lose your nutritional value. Hey, so it might fill your tummy, but if you miss the nutrition. Hey, so I think the better way of preserving vegetables. But absolutely, processing and value addition has should be much more also in the curriculum. Hey, and don't, don't split horticulture production from other parts in the value chain. That's one continuum, so you need to connect it. And I think sometimes education is a bit sort of, sorry, everybody, a, 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 bit, a bit focused, <laughs> yeah? It's a lovely discussion, but we need to get working and looking at my colleagues, yeah? Because we have all our epiphic people there, and they might think they're nicely sitting back, but we want to sort of get a few things still going how to link with industry, but also about how we assure the quality of education and sort of keep that going. Mr. Thank Chair? You. Thank you. I think we need that curriculum. Yes, it's okay. So thank you very much. I think we have seen that interesting conversation. We will actually push this conversation online. And, and we will provide the contacts of Irene, and, and definitely we will, we will push this uh, to the next level. So let's appreciate Irene once more. So at this point, we want to take it to the next level. Um, I know the e-pivot group is supposed to move to the next arena, uh, that is Theater 3 and Theater 4. So we want to appreciate you again, and we will give you some time as you move to the other theater, then we can start the other program uh, for uh, our internal uh, researchers here. And at this point, I want to invite the session chairs and the rapporteur for this session. That is Dr. Onyambu and Dr. Chege.
Unii conexiuni ca pa... Pa, vai, de la... Bună, că e pe la... Mă rog, e și-a download, e și-a download. De ce, nu ne cam am făcut extra, extra și așa. Ține lor numai cum a... Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to invite you to uh, another session in this uh, Meru University of Science and uh, Technology International Conference, where we have uh, grantees who received internal research grants uh, from Meru University. Uh, are going to present findings from uh, their research uh, so far. So our first presenter is going to be Dr. Kennedy Gashoka, uh, who is the uh, Dean of the School of uh, uh, Pure and Applied Sciences. He is going to present about the, uh, the title of his project is Biological Characterization of uh, Whitefly Populations in Meru County, Kenya. Uh, Karibu, Dr. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, so, you have heard my name. It's also on the first slide there. My name is Dr. Ashoka. And uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Biological Characterization of Whitefly Populations in this county. And like you've also heard, this is a work that was done quite some years back. Uh, in the second call, I believe that should have been in 2012, 2013 or so, maybe the directorate will confirm the year. We were among the first people to get this funding. We were young uh, researchers then, and we are happy that uh, we got this seed money to actually uh, help us move to the next level. I don't know if I consider myself a young researcher anymore, if I'm vet a veteran, but I think I'm some, somewhere in the middle because we still have professors, our mentors, we are learning a lot from them. Right now I'm a senior lecturer, but then I must say it, it was quite some early years. It was uh, not long after uh, schooling. I had attained the PhD in 2010. And so let me talk about it as it happened then. Uh, Chair, maybe do I still have those 15 minutes? Yes. Or it's more? Yeah, minutes. Okay. I'll try to... Let me just set in mind so that I'm also time conscious. So really the title of the work is as shown there. And I worked with a few gentlemen uh, whose names are also shown there. My research area is actually in the area of entomology. Entomology is a study of, I know we are a mixed uh, audience. I'll try not to be too technical. So, um, Entomology and integrated pest and also vector management. That is my area. And uh, the candidates is actually the insect that you see there, the white fly, of course, quite and large there. As we shall see, it's not as big, but I'm hoping that we all get an idea of what I want to talk about. Uh, the white fly, we call it Benicia tabasi, the scientific name. Let me get right into the presentation. I will follow this synopsis, uh, give us a little background about white flies and the problem that we are looking at, justification of that problem, the objectives we had, the methodology we followed, and then the results and the discussion of those results. So, um, starting with the white fly, it has many synonyms or common names, if you so like. Some people will talk about the sweet potato white fly, the cassava white fly, tobacco, cotton white fly. And so basically, but the scientific name is the same, Bemisia tabasi. And this was, uh, I mean, uh, the reason it has so many names is because of its polyphagous nature, which simply means it has multiple host range, can attack a lot of crops, even wild plants, weeds, and so on. Uh, in terms of how it looks, I think we saw from the first slide, but it's really just one millimeter. A very tiny insect. In fact, when you're working with them, if you're not careful, you get to inhale them, especially if the, the colony is really big. I can assure you that uh, because an insect I've worked with for quite some time, I've really swallowed quite a number through inhalation, through the mouth, and so on. When I was working with them, actually, we didn't have masks. Now people wear masks when they're working with white flies because they are really tiny, with a pale body, pale yellow body, and white waxy powder. This powder makes it very difficult to control using pesticides because it confers some kind of protection uh, on them. Another the characteristic of these uh, small insects is their eyes. They are red, and uh, of course, entomologically speaking, they are not true flies, but I think I'll not dwell into that. That is, they are not like mosquitoes or house flies in terms of classification. And they go long back in terms of description to way back in 1889 in Greece by a gentleman called Gennadius. Uh, why are they important? Uh, they have both uh, direct and indirect importance. The direct importance is because of the importance in the transmission of viruses. I've given just but a few examples. African cassava mosaic virus, the first one there. Tomato yellow leaf curl virus you know, big golden mosaic viruses, and so on. And 
This happens in a lot of vegetables, you say they are polyphagous, ornamental crops, in field crops, in, on weeds, I mean, maybe on weeds we can't count because weeds are also not desirable. But the indirect importance is basically in form of what you call honeydew. If you look at the, the third uh, square there, the field crops, that's an orange crop or plantation. And you can see some black mass because what they do is they excrete honeydew, which is honey-like, which then attracts fungal spores, which then grow, and this can be very serious, especially on ornamentals, you know, on fruits. And uh, the other one is, of course, that honeydew traps the natural enemies, very tiny insects that tend to come and attack their eggs. They get stuck, and so the natural control becomes interfered with. In terms of distribution, it's a test of importance across the world. All that, those green areas, you can see both in the temperate areas and the tropics, in the field and greenhouses, white flies are a big problem, even to date. Uh, now, a, a lot of work has really gone as a precursor to applied research in white fly, uh, gen, I mean, a study of uh, white flies. A lot of work has gone into their identity, especially genetic, I mean, using a lot of molecular methods, uh, their bionomics, life history and bionomics. By bionomics, we are talking about the relationship with the hosts, the multiple hosts, and uh, their ability to transmit viruses. So where you see ticks, a lot of work has gone into that. But there are still gaps, or there were still gaps by the time we proposed, so we did this proposal. Uh, because not only are white flies polyphagous, but they are also able to adapt to new hosts in new environments. And we have new biotypes. That is a level below the species, the subspecies. Some biotypes that seem to have a preference for one uh, crop, you know, and so on. So we talk of biotypes. And so unless you characterize at a local level, it becomes very difficult to know what you're dealing with. And that's why we felt we needed to do that in Meru County at the local level so that at least that information could go to the farmers. And another reason is that there is need uh, to incorporate several approaches if you want to consistently and comprehensively uh, be able to describe uh, uh, white flies in the, local, in the locality. And so this is one very, uh, uh, I mean, can reproduce we can have up to 24 generations per year of white flies. So you can see it's very versatile. It's a very versatile pest. And who are the stakeholders, the potential beneficiaries of what we did? So they range from peasants, small-scale farmers, in-growers, out-growers, the players in the agro, chemical sector, integrated pest management, pest player, all these people. Uh, would actually benefit from this, uh, the, the output of this research. And um, in terms of placing, really, this project is actually, can be, or rather, by then we had the SDGs, and it was fitting squarely at the SDG2, basically, which was about adding hunger, achieving food security, improved nutrition, and promoting sustainable agriculture. And at the big four, the economic pillar, that, and uh, that was vision of Vision 20, that. The objectives are uh, four of them. The first was to determine the position preference, where they like to lay eggs, so the position is all about egg laying. Uh, we, we used five crops as listed there. Then to compare the relationship between their insect, uh, susceptibility to insecticides and the biotypes themselves. Then we also wanted to look at a bit of morphology. Can we actually be able to use certain characters to tell without going to a very expensive method of trying to tell the differences between these white flies? And so that's what we sought out to do. We did that in the field, we did that in the laboratory, and we did that on various sites in this county. One was our farm here. We also worked at the Kaguru Agricultural Training Center. I think we know where, I'm sure most of us will know where it is. And then the then Meru Technical Training Institute. It is now called Kenya National, I mean Meru National Polytechnic. But I decided to use the name that was, that was valid then because it was back then. And uh, for the position preference, we basically came up with very simple cages, 
made of petri dishes, tested two biotypes. We had uh, settled on these two based on previous research. Like I said, uh, our history with the white flies had gone way back to postgraduate studies, master's level, 2005 actually. I think the first time I really worked with these uh, tests. So five crops, which you've already seen, did 10 replicates each. A total of 1,250 females and 4,000 plus eggs. For insecticidal tolerance, we used a technique called the glass vial technique. Basically, we coat the tubing you see there, and then introduce the white flies, close it, and let them interact with their pesticide. Again, the two biotypes, using five serial dilutions, uh, then monitor mortality, replicate, and so on, across all the sites. For the uh, morphological features, basically, we used the fourth instar, the one with, you can see before, with, before the one with the red eyes, there's the fourth instar there on the life cycle, you can see it. Then, of course, adults that were emergent or new, and we worked in the lab, uh, inactivated them, and then made temporary slides, which we then looked at under the microscope. And what we are looking at were basically morphological features like leg ratio, antennae, all these features. Actually, this is just a small section of the features we looked at because we worked with 24 different characters under the microscope. And then we analyzed this, uh, char these characters, the ones that could be measurable, that were measurable, some was just observation. And then uh, analyzed that using parsimony analysis and came up with three diagrams to basically see whether it was consistent with data that we already had. It was like a continuation because the nature of research is to build up on what you have done before. In terms of what we got, in terms of results, uh, again, this is just a section of uh, uh, the data that we came across uh, of the position in terms of laying eggs, comparing the two biotypes, and you can look at this data column-wise, so that if you see a letter coming along a column, similar letter, then the difference was not statistically significant. If it is different, it was. And we did that pairwise uh, comparison across these crops. Uh, okay, then we also did work with the uh, insecticides, the common ones that farmers were using locally. We had established that from the agrochem outlets. And so we, this is the kind of data we came across. I think the most important column here is the LC50. We call it the leader concentration 50. That is the concentration that gives 50% of the target population. Then the slope is also maybe another important uh, column that we could look at. As you can see, LC50 between populations was significantly different with the 95% fiducial limits did not overlap. We also compared the three pesticides, these are the three, uh, to see which one was more effective. Again, here the most important probably is the slope and the LC50. The other columns, uh, you may not worry too much about uh, right now. And then a number of, I told you we worked with 24 characters. This is just um, a preview of some of the data we came across, right from measuring the length of the antenna, the width, the body, and so on. And uh, we came up with a lot of data again. And this data is in millimeters because we're talking about a very tiny uh, organism or insect. We made some inferences from our data. First is that we established our two biotypes predominantly, which we labeled the cassava, seemed to like cassava. The non-cassava was more polyphagous, but was not, did not like cassava. And so with this, the first one, it seemed to significantly prefer cassava. I mean to prefer tomato when paired with any other hosts and li uh, showed least preference for the sweet potato. The non cassava one had more or less the same, but this preferred the fine beans, but the rest followed. But sweet potato was least preferred in all cases. In terms of uh, insecticide resistance, the response patterns varied between the biotypes and also the locations, uh, so that uh, the cassava biotype was significantly more susceptible, especially that collected from the most farm. But both populations were relatively heterogeneous as far as uh, this was concerned. And as far as the morphometrics were concerned, 
we found that nine of the 24 characters varied significantly. So we could did a combined cluster analysis and came up with two major clusters, which are shown here. If you look at uh, the 52% similarity, you can see two clusters that come out, and you'll notice the lower one has cassava, 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 and then the rest, of course, which are still also split a bit. So uh, that is what we came up with. And so the morphometrics revealed that there are distinct variations which could be explored for morphological delineation. Then, uh, so we concluded as follows, that uh, the different, I mean, in terms of position, the different biotypes, the different biotypes have differences in, uh, of the position trends, implying, actually underpinning the need to understand local populations. If already you could see some variation and we are within just one county, you can imagine how big it can get. In terms of insecticides, uh, one biotype, we saw was more susceptible than the others. And in terms of the pesticides, the three that we tested, two were almost equally efficacious, but one was least efficacious, that is lambda cyhalothrin. In terms of morphology and morphometrics, we realized that the fourth pupil insta really was the most dependable. These other features seemed to change depending on the hosts that the white fly was found in. And so our recommendation was that there is still need for complementarity of biological characters, morphological characters, and genetics. Of course, which were not really part of this study, but which we have also worked with as far as white flies are concerned. Uh, so, uh, just a few of the references. And uh, of course, acknowledge that um, this, like I said at the beginning, it was, uh, this work was funded from the second call, and even the fourth call. We also got some. So thank you very much, the chair. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gashoka, for that uh, presentation about your work. So uh, initially, we meant to have three presenters present, then we ask questions at the end, but we have a technical issue on Zoom, so we will uh, request Dr. Ari to take questions. So the microphone for questions, please. So uh, those who have uh, questions, uh, please raise your hand uh, or comment. Uh, Prof. Mishiri. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Ari, for the good presentation. Uh, based on the, the results that you've uh, shared with us, yes. you've indicated that there are two uh, morphometric uh, or bio, biotypes of uh, this uh, fly. Do they transmit um, uh, similar viruses or uh, there is delay variation? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Maybe we take all, then we address it. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Gajoka, for that uh, nice presentation. I have two comments, uh, which uh, you might maybe treat them as questions or just uh, smoke as uh, if I just comment. One is uh, uh, a concern on uh, the effect of this uh, flight on uh, human beings. Particularly when you say it, uh, each time you went to the field, uh, you suspected that uh, you inhaled quite a number. Yes. Did you feel anything made of the funny <laughs> that uh, maybe it's because of those flies which I inhaled when I was in the field? Mm. Uh, that's a straightforward question which you can either say no or yes. Mm. The other one is uh, uh, the effect of, or the possible effect by climate change. The first time I came to Meru was in the late 80s, and uh, there was a lot of rain in, uh, in Meru. It was very cold, and so on. Now, for the time you've been doing your research, have you been trying to look at the numbers, at least estimate the numbers, 
uh, which might have been uh, affected by the climate change. Because uh, you said you started this work in uh, 2012. Well, that time you said uh, you, uh, you, you think you were very young that time, but don't worry about that one. You are still the same the doctor I used to meet in uh, JQuad. You were in JQuad also, as a master of PhD. And uh, you are not the only one who should not worry. There are many who I used to see and they think they are getting older than not. But then you, for you, <laughs> have there been any change you suspect as a result of the climate change? It is now very dry. Uh, many parts of the country who we may come from, they are very dry and I suspect they have been a change. Now for this, has there, do, you, do you think that is a change? And, uh, are you working on that, or you are, for, you are not working on that? Sorry, thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Natsuko, yes. for the mechanistic research. Uh, I have a concern. Now that you identified the species, and some species were not susceptible to the habitat or the chemicals that are used, now, what advice did you, did you advise the farmers not to use the chemical, or what step did you take? Because that means we might be using the wrong pesticide for the wrong variety. And secondly, there is what we call sharp crops. Now that we've seen some crops are more appealing to those, uh, to, to the wildlife, I'm wondering, could we explore the sharp crops? Such that, for example, if I want to grow tomato and they prefer cassava, can I grow cassava and strap crop so that we limit the use of herbicides or pesticides? Because uh, as we start now, we know that cases of cancer are alarming in many counties. And it's all tied to the use of the many agrochemicals that farmers are using. Thank you. I think we have one from the chair here, Chair Franz. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Choka, for the research that is very scientific. So I have a concern on uh, that ASPE translation. Because we also think of the audience. We, some of us are historians, so <laughs> you might ask look like we need to go to school. <laughs> uh, so that's the school in the year for. Then the other one is uh, there is the research questions that uh, prove brought you to this point of trying to research. Maybe there were part of the objects, but I think um, it's good to ground on your research what is it that bothered you to come up to the, the kind of the research question that you may have used to frame your, your study. And uh, did you, what did you do this research? Do you have research assistants, like students? Are there students who work alongside you as part of training? Because uh, globally, you cannot get a grant if you want, if there is not training. And the country, I don't think we, we, we are saying that train the students. They have students that get in that uh, So is that something that uh, you may have? How about uh, innovation as it was to another level? Publication and innovation, so that um, you can support those targeted. Uh, I'm sure these insects affect farmers, so you may be solving a problem in the society. So along the research in innovation and IT uh, commercialization, I have many questions, but uh, for now I think you can respond them. Sorry, maybe that will be the last question. We are running out of time. We give him the last question.
Thank you, Dr. Ali, for that uh, uh, beautiful presentation. I have a question for the, uh, the cluster here. Yeah? Yes. Those white flies, are they related to other white flies in the world from your analysis? Yeah? And then uh, we also saw that uh, they mispreferred uh, protein, sweet potatoes. In your own opinion, is there a reason for that? And then from uh, maybe the chemicals that were used to control the, the white flies, uh, could there be an issue of resistance with the chemicals that showed there that was not responding to uh, the white flies as it could be? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who has asked a question. So I think we now uh, respond to these questions, maybe in the order in which they came. Um, okay, so the first thing was about the two biotypes and the ability to transmit viruses. Yes, I will say that um, white flies are principally known for their transmission of viruses. The only difference would be, of course, if it does not seem to like a certain host. For example, we talked of the first virus there, African cassava mosaic virus. Of course, it must be able to feed on cassava. Okay? So, those that prefer or at least like cassava will transmit viruses in cassava. But you've seen there are a range of viruses. Actually, there are so many, I think about 20-something, although we listed only a few, the most common. So, Yes, they will transfer uh, viruses, of course, to the hosts that they, they prefer. But the issue about trans, uh, the ability to transmit, I think I had listed it also, that it's one of the areas that has, is quite well researched and well understood. So we actually know exactly which viruses they transmit in which crops. So the answer is yes. Then uh, there was a question on the effect of white flies, or the flies on human beings especially, if swallowed. <laughs> You know, as an insect scientist, I've been promoting, or rather, as I speak to my students, I've been telling them the future of food security is in the feeding of on insects. We call it entomophage, insects as food. So that I know we have a few examples in the African culture where we actually feed on locusts, uh, crickets, or products associated with that. So, of course, you, you choke a bit, but uh, unless of course, unless of course they are sprayed and they have pesticides on them, maybe that would not be very safe. But I would say there's really, there was, there's really nothing to worry about if one gets in. I mean, there are weevils in... When we went to high school, we ate weevils in beans and we came out. <laughs> so anyway, insects can be fed on. Maybe white flies are not candidates, maybe because of their size and so on. But uh, it's not, uh, I don't think it's a big deal uh, if it happens. Uh, the possible effects of climate change Yes, we do have now what you're calling cross-border pests. Uh, in fact, before this, I again had to want some funding for postdoctorate, which I did also here. And basically, in that, we looked at seasonal dynamics and population, seasonal yeah, dynamics and population dynamics of uh, white flies across two years. And we found that, of course, because of the change in weather patterns, again, there were changes. But the interesting thing or the, is that they actually prefer dry weather. When crops are, you know, are stressed, that's when they thrive. But succulent crop does not support white flies. So actually, this change, especially if it's towards dryness, it's actually favoring the development of um, uh, uh, white flies. Uh, there was a question on non-susceptibility. I mean, to, uh, to pesticides, usually this is the first sign, the first sign of development of resistance, which is a big problem right now. We have a whole website dedicated to insecticide, we call it Iraq, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. And you know, it, I mean, developing a pesticide is so expensive, but getting resistance to it can happen. If farmers don't follow certain procedures, it can happen very fast. A very big investment can actually get wasted. So. To farmers, of course, we have always advised them, first avoid calendar spray, where you say every two weeks I have to spray my potatoes, whether they are pests or not, and stuff like that. But most important is that we emphasize on what we call integrated pest management, cultural control methods, 
biological control methods, the use of pesticides or chemical control, and physical methods. Uh, there was a question on KST. Uh, I want to confirm that actually, yes, this work was done uh, together, jointly with students. Uh, at that point, we did have postgraduate students, but we had a bachelor's uh, level, two groups. Normally, we group those ones. They don't work individually. Two groups benefited from this. It also led to publications. It has been published. This work has been published and presented in similar conferences. But we have also come up with a way of repackaging the data, and we are hoping we can also publish in our most journal after this conference. Uh, so, it, it, yes, students played a critical role uh, in this. I didn't really work on it uh, alone. Then there was the issue of clustering. And uh, yes, the thing is, uh, yes, it is true that you have to actually relate with, with other white flies in the world. And there are so many white flies in the world. Uh, I may not have shown here, but it's true. We have shown that these white flies are related to what we call the Q biotype according to the word clusters. Uh, why sweet potatoes? Actually, what the common name for these white flies, the most common, although we say they have various names, is sweet potato white fly. And I think that is why the, the, the reason that actually led to them being associated with sweet potatoes, because, I mean, of their preference, preferences here and there. And I think the issue of chemical resistance also came up, which I say, yes, the, uh, resistance is developing at an alarming rate, and I think, um, it's time, I mean, we are working with farmers to actually show them how to actually delay this because it's a natural process, natural selection. It depends on the pressure that you subject these uh, uh, white flies to and it can develop quickly or not. It's a big problem already in the, in the horticulture industry. And um, yes, so it's a real concern as far as white flies are concerned, especially with any organism with a short generation life cycle. Resistance can develop very fast. Thank you. I can see my chairman uh, wants really to take over. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, it's a good problem when there is a lot of uh, passion uh, and uh, reactions uh, from the audience. So uh, please clap for Dr. for a great presentation. So now I would uh, like to invite our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Kubison from the School of uh, Business. Uh, he's going to talk to us about entrenching private partnerships in school. Uh, Karibu, Dr. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So this is Kubison. Kubison is uh, coming here, uh, here this afternoon to present to you an, an ongoing study. This study is not complete, so I do not have 
all the results. But I felt that this uh, is a, an important uh, forum for me to discuss what is going on in the field so that uh, you can also make your contribution. So this area is uh, called public-private partnership. So things that I, there are issues that I want, I want to discuss with you this afternoon. One of them is I will introduce what PPP means. Then I look at uh, the study objective or the project objective. Uh, we'll look at uh, the parties of interest that I have interacted with during uh, the, this preliminary stage. The results of the preliminary survey that I have carried out and then the status of the project currently and uh, what, what remains undone and uh, how I intend to do, to do it or to go about it. Now, the concept of, of I'm in the School of Business and Management, School of Business and uh, Economics, sorry, and uh, the Business Management Department. So, the concept of public-private partnership uh, is where public and the private parties design to work together or to cooperate. So in your mind, you can just say it is cooperation between a public and a private entity for some services that uh, mostly either of the parties is, uh, um, is offering. Now, I have concentrated on schools. And uh, uh, you, you will see that in uh, private, in uh, public schools, or public entities, there is always a reason to develop. You look at our government, uh, the government is the one that uh, funds our schools. And the, the schools are experiencing quite a number of challenges. And so that is what triggered this study. In 2022, uh, the students that are expect they're in uh, secondary schools in this country around I think there couldn't be four million. The children who are going to be in school, in secondary schools, probably in two years' time, couldn't be six million. Because we have a, a, a group that is called CMBC, or a new system that we are starting. And if you go to these schools, the junior secondary, although I do not know where now it will be uh, anchored, whether in a primary or secondary school, there couldn't be a problem because of the facilities. So, sorry, I don't know whether this thing has disappeared. Okay, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. So PPPs, we are saying, can, be, can include the sophisticated infrastructure initiatives that are um, uh, organized and done between two parties, public and the private. But it can also be just a cooperation between the two parties. Now, pressure from public uh, debt reduction in most of the, the developing countries has forced, uh, uh, is forcing uh, governments to try to check whether they can get some assistance from the private sector. And the private sector's participation in education matters is really key at this point. So uh, this study, sorry, I don't know whether I'm able to work with this. OK, sorry. Yes, the private sector, there are several uh, modules that uh, are available in uh, this engagement, public-private partnership. There are modules or initiatives that, are, uh, that we find around the world. Now, one of them is called pri uh, public or private, sorry, private sector philanthropic in initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, you have, have, uh, you have heard about uh, uh, foundations, like in this country, you have heard uh, Aga Khan Foud Education Foundation or Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundations. These are purely private entities that are aimed at supporting public schools or public institutions that are in education. 
Now, there are also school management initiatives where they, we cooperate between the public and private uh, institutions or schools in order to undertake public uh, school operations. We have government purchase in initiatives where the government tries to subsidize or try to help education institutions to run their programs better. Voucher-like initiatives, again, where the government tries to see how uh, the public, sorry, the, the private sector tries to see how the government can, can be able to help to fund the, either private public or private, because sometimes even the government can support the, the private uh, schools. There's an uh, adopt a school program or initiative and uh, if you go to some schools where you were, you may have formed some called, something called an alumni, where people who went through the schools, uh, through these schools, can come back and try to support the, 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 the development of that institution. So there's a school capacity building initiatives where you could uh, use an institution like this one, or an, a private institution, or a private or agents, to try to help public institution to to run some programs, not necessarily infrastructure, could be certain programs. Let's say developing, develop, developing ICT infrastructure or processes like even teaching, uh, teaching processes. So there are more modules, there are very many, many modules that the world has seen. There's a model that is used in Meru and which I've seen in public schools but in primary schools and which are working very, I mean, which are, which are very, very long term, they are long term and they have worked very well. I've seen uh, where the church, church being a private uh, entity, has trying to collaborate with the government to develop schools, to run schools. For example, we have one of the best performing uh, primary school around here, called Kenjai Circuit Build Boarding School, actually it is the best in this sub-county. It's a public institution, it's a public primary school, but it is supported or it is developed by a, a church organization, a church known as MCK, Methodist Church. The best performing public school for many years, Kondi Kadigiri, is also a public school, it's a, a primary public school. And it, is a, it has been developed through a cooperation between the church and the government. So you can see that kind of a collaboration is not happening in secondary schools. And so the question that came to mind is, what can be done to improve our schools? Ladies and gentlemen, what we have seen, you will be surprised that this sub-county, this sub-county where this university is, uh, has a lot of challenge when it comes to secondary school education, as you are going to see. So I have carried out some preliminary study. I've talked to three parties. The first part is the Ministry of Education. What did I get from the Ministry of Education regarding public-private partnership uh, for schools? So the public-private sector are governed by different value systems as according to Ministry of Education. And so they have different interests. However, the, the Ministry of Education would like the private entities to support public uh, institutions, public schools. But without without putting a lot of pressure, or without uh, w without uh, I mean without uh, having a lot of conditions, and that that means uh, freely supporting them. Now the Ministry of Education uh, in uh, sub I mean works with the private sector in developing education in this country through an organisation or they partner with private entities and uh, probably at at higher level at uh, as a large scale level and that was that was uh, that's something that goes on in the country so the ministry would question the motive of a private sector that want to engage in a ppp arrangement as i said most of the ppc uh, ppp public private partnerships are in at a large scale so the government uh, some time back uh, engaged or has been encouraging has been encouraging the private sector to support. There's uh, one organization known as KEPSA, which is, stands for uh, Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Uh, it, it, it is a representative umbrella body of uh, the private sector organizations. We have organizations like UK and or UNICEF that the government partners with, and over a long period of time, this thing has been happening. Uh, the government provides the schools 
or it is the, the motive of the I mean the, the, the mandate of the Ministry for Education to support their public schools. However, as I mentioned, we have, we have the schools right now are facing a lot of challenges because uh, the capitation, because the government, the public schools uh, re, re, re depend on the capitation from the government. And you all know the challenges that we are facing. Even the, uh, the school's uh, infrastructure, like uh, to accommodate junior secondary schools, you have heard what the, the, the minister for the secretary, cabinet secretary said the other day that uh, right now the secondary schools uh, infrastructure may not be able to support all the children. Therefore, the private sector has been called on board to try to help and uh, probably even develop junior secondary schools within or house them within the primary schools. So that tells you there's a, a, a challenge that we are, we are going to face next year. Now, and uh, that's why uh, it is very, very important for this public-private partnership to be encouraged and supported. Now, individual schools management sometimes may not be allowed to engage the private sector, especially if uh, a lot of uh, resources are required, or where you do a contract and then you expect them to pay, you expect the government to pay, and uh, the government may not be willing. However, it can be done because we have seen these partnerships in the far, in the past in secondary schools, where. Uh, for example, you have hand schools that buy school buses using an arrangement uh, between the private sector, could be the banking institutions or the, the manufacturers of these vehicles and the, 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 the schools have been using, running these vehicles and paying uh, instruments pole pole. So these things do happen. So the mandate is uh, the mandate of M, M uh, Minister of Education at this point is to make sure that they protect the public institutions against exploitation by the by anybody, including the private sector. That's that's the question that uh, the ministry gave. Now, if a board of uh, a board of management is interested in uh, uh, engaging the private sector, and it is something that is going to involve finances. Uh, and it's a long-term thing, then you have to seek authority from the minister, from the PS, the principal secretary. In writing and until it is allowed, you are not supposed to engage uh, uh, the private sector, especially if it, in, it involves a lot of finances. But if it is purely philanthropic, the ministry has no problem with that. So the other party that uh, I consulted is called KEPSA the organization that represents private sector and has collaborated, collaborated with the, 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 the government in the education sector in many areas. And these are the areas they sent, they, they collaborate with. First of all, they sent KEPSA engages the government uh, on matters of education in something that they, they don't call it public-private partnership, they call it public-private dialogue. Because they don't, they don't uh, finance, but what they do in this engagement is uh, they, 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 they hold meetings, discussions, they give, um, uh, they, they give their skills, because they have professionals who can be able to, uh, to act as consultants for the government and the, for the private sector and develop uh, big, big projects for the, for the, for the public, uh, pr public sector. For instance, KEPSA, participated in something that is called CBC curriculum, the one that we are uh, very, very proud of. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Then it also participated in something called NEMIS, National Education Management Information System. This is a project that is aimed at uh, achieving the accuracy of data for the entire education system. You know NEMIS, how it works in schools these days. But it also participated in development of TVET SIDAC uh, body, which, is develop, which has developed a CBET program, or which is involved in CBET pro, uh, curriculum, sorry, CBET curriculum. CBET is like the CBC. CBET at uh, our level is uh, the CBC in primary schools. So again, you can see KEPSA, this uh, private and public engagement has been uh, very, very visible. It, has, it also engaged the government, or the government engaged the private sector also, in uh, Kenya National Qualifications Framework, which led to what we call Kenya National Qualifications Authority, a body that uh, is supposed to equalize certifications 
and the recognizing prior learning and the experiential learning in this country. This thing was not there before. Then it has also uh, been involved in the placement of government-sponsored uh, students to private universities. This is something that started two, three years ago. It is now working. And uh, uh, these are some of the things that are going on. So you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that the uh, private sector is uh, well uh, engaged in uh, public uh, institutions matters on development. So what we wanted to know is, is it possible for this engagement to be devolved, to be devolved to where lower levels? Uh, and uh, we feel that it is possible that this, this engagement can be brought down. Now, the school management, we have talked to school managers, and school managers in our preliminary study uh, said this, that uh, the first thing, this is what we found out, that the schools depend purely on uh, government capitation. The schools that we, we looked at, we tend to study, uh, I've also shown that partnerships that are available are, uh, and it's very, very few schools, partnerships that are available are uh, uh, mainly from contributions by the parents. Uh, that's the uh, parents' projects that are held in secondary schools, that, are, that uh, do developments in secondary schools. Otherwise, it is the government, the ministry that funds uh, secondary schools and, uh, and also the national government, CNDF. And uh, sometimes it is not, uh, it's not adequate. That's uh, something that we found. Very few schools are pertinent or receive donations from NGOs or the private sector. Uh, now, these schools would prefer infrastructure development because the schools that were surveyed show, have shown a lot of uh, uh, deficiency when it comes to infrastructure and development. There's need to identify partners to aid the schools. If there's a way, anybody in this country can help schools that are struggling to get partners, to get them, it would be very, very good. The schools also said they would prefer two models, uh, or that there are models that they would prefer in this engagement. And uh, the first one is annual payment. Uh, and the other one, annual payment is where the government pays the investor after completing the infrastructural development, after completing a project. Now, I don't know why, why you are coming next to me. I believe. Because you are up, your 15 minutes are up. I, th I think I, I need more five minutes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go, let, let me explain that uh, in this preliminary study, we looked at uh, of the schools, the schools that are in Tigania's West Sub County. Now, out of the 50 schools that are here, 46 schools were surveyed. In these schools, 65 schools, I mean 65 percent of them are day schools, and then um, the remaining are either boarding school or uh, and day and boarding. Then the, we interviewed 46 school managers, and this was carried out between September and December 2021. The field standards I mentioned earlier on, it is ongoing, and uh, I expect that the field work will be completed in September this year. Uh, and the next thing is that uh, these schools, I don't want to go to the school size because you realize that uh, most of these schools have uh, very few students. That's something that we found out. That uh, close to 50% of these schools are not able to fit, I mean to, to, to have adequate students. So they are struggling with the capacity. The few schools that are boarding and in extra or uh, there are those schools that are categorized as ex extra county schools, they are congested. That's another problem, and I know there's a problem that is with uh, many, many schools outside uh, this sub county. But this sub county, as I mentioned, has a unique problem. As a unique problem. The performance of the examination, we tend to look at the, the, the most recent examination results. And you see that out of the, public, uh, the 50 public secondary schools that did KCSE this year, uh, which is called the KCSE 2021, 2,605 students were the, one, the, the ones that did the exam. Out of these uh, students, it's only 252 that attended C plus and above. 252 in the whole sub-county are the, the students who attend 
C plus and above. C plus is the minimum that allows students to undertake university and degree programs. And uh, it's only three, I mean, it's, it's 80 schools, it's only 80 schools that have standard principal's offices, or what you call, and, and staff rooms. It's only 15 schools that have standard science labs, so many schools are lacking labs, and there's only six schools that have standard buildings for libraries. So you can imagine the, the, the majority of these schools lack those uh, basic facilities. The libraries, where students can do their private studies, the laboratories where they can do, they are able to do the, their science practicals. Now, this tells you that we have a serious problem in this, uh, uh, in this sub county. And the, 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 one of the ways, one of the major ways to solve this problem, according to this study, is to enhance the public-private partnership. And uh, uh, you realize that number, 252 students go, qualifying to go to university, if you go to the neighboring sub-county, you'll find that one school has more than these students. Just one school, one national school that is uh, in the neighboring sub-county. As more students, is taking more students with C plus and above to, ICE, to universities uh, than, than, than what this, the whole sub-county of 50 schools uh, is going to take. Now, these schools, the internal school projects in the next three years, uh, the school managers, according to them, they need two important things. Uh, the first one is water, or the preference is water. This, uh, there is a, quite a, a large area within the sub-county that, uh, that uh, people experience a lot of uh, water shortage. And uh, I know, at a time like now, things are very, very serious. Then the other one is science labs. Uh, others are minimal, like classrooms. Uh, as I said, they have classrooms, but very few students. Because uh, close to 50% of these schools have uh, less than 100 students. I mean, between 100 students and uh, 200 students in the whole school. Okay, uh, let me see. Something else is that uh, the school managers feel that what is important for them is the infrastructure. And I mentioned science lab, uh, even uh, water projects. Uh, what they would pro prefer, the managers, the BOM to procure the rule PP, P pro, uh, arrangement is uh, mostly uh, those things that I mentioned, water, science labs. Then the infrastructure is initiative, because we have seen that they want infrastructure mostly, uh, how would they want the, the model, which model would they want to, to use in this engagement? And they send the first one is uh, the annuity payment uh, model. Annuity payment is where the government will give money after a contractor that you engage completes the project. And they will send a pri private finance initiative where the government uh, can pay periodically. The private sector comes in, finances the school, and then the government pays in instruments later on. Either the government or whoever uh, is, going, is willing to pay for the, for the, for the institution. Now, the problems that are involved with the PPP, they cited quite a number, like but they said one of the major problems that they find with the contracts is the long tendering process, and this is contained in uh, the government uh, policies and so on. Factors that can lead to a successful PPP is a competitive procurement process. In other words, fairness. Fairness in identifying who how the, the identifying how the contract is going to be handled between these two parties. School managers' views on common risks, uh, financial risk and so, and other risks have been uh, listed that they find, but we are saying that risks, risks in any business, you should prepare for them. What we need to do as entities, as public, whether public or private entities, in any kind of a, an arrangement like this one, is uh, to manage risks. Uh, what do they recommend the service providers to, to get uh, in terms of interest, for example? Because we said in this engagement sometimes the, the private contractor can do the work and then the, 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 the owner of the project or the person who is uh, the agent, sorry, yeah, the agent like a school board can pay periodically or can pay later on. So what interest do you give, want to give to this private contractor or partner, they said between ten and thirty per between ten and thirty percent is okay, and that's actually 
what happens uh, that a percent of the project cost uh, and uh, below that. Now, this stand as some unfinished uh, finished business, as I mentioned. Now, this stand would like to design uh, uh, PPP models that are suitable for public schools in this sub county. And then they would like to discuss with the private, the private sector, the private sector on how they, uh, they, they, are, they are willing to support, because there are some private sectors that are willing to support. What I got from these uh, uh, schools is that sometimes they do not even know who can help. What can we do uh, in this project? In this project, the university can be a partner through mentorship. There's something that is called adopting a school. And uh, the intention of this study is uh, by the end of it, one of the outputs is to adopt either one or two schools and engage in uh, some form of development. It may not be necessarily financing, but it is a development that is going to uplift and uh, improve the qualities of these schools. Now that model, uh, once it works, it can be now uh, taken or adopted in several other schools in the sub county. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is about cooperation between public and private sector. So when I'm through with this one, I will come again. You allow me again to come in a conference like this and uh, present the results. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, please clap for our presenter. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kubaison, for uh, a very engaging uh, presentation. Uh, we were going to have four presentations before we break for lunch. Uh, we've taken a little longer than we hoped. So we are going to invite uh, maybe two questions uh, for the speaker before we break for lunch. Then we will reconvene. I would like to request the rest of the speakers in the afternoon, please uh, stick to time. Uh, I, I, I think we were given a guide for slides that, that you are going to use. We had only slotted 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Any questions for this speaker, please? Yes. Kobay, mm. so uh, that was very engaging, really, and thank you for the presentation. Majority of the churches have uh, partnered with the schools. Um, uh, is it um, uh, part of their social responsibility or business? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Mine is about justification. I've seen where you have talked about the performance, and uh, we fail to see the justification about the relationship for the DPOP towards the performance. And also, another concern is about settling on for six schools out of the fifty. Why did you decide on that? And in that case, is it ethical? Because does it mean the other schools don't really need to benefit from this case? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you have uh, talked about the schools partnerships uh, between with uh, Mina uh, in schools and also prisons. We understand that about the schools, but the prisons are not aware. Maybe you can uh, give an example. Pris sorry, prisons? Prisons, yeah. You have indicated some about prisons. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kupaisson. Um, I'm still struggling. Uh, I might have some bias because I'm from the business world. Yes. I'm still struggling to, to, to see your research uh, statement here. Because what I have listened to is mainly the commonplace issue. Uh, why am I saying this? I'm saying infrastructure development, even in our own university here, is 
a real issue and it actually cuts across secondary and even primary. But from what um, I have listened to, uh, I'm still struggling to understand this issue of entrenching public private partnerships. Um, I'm not clear in my mind that the research you're going to do might yield much because um, just to give you a bit of uh, understanding or insights, uh, PPP in the actual sense is anchored on the PPP Act. And for you to develop at a school, you need the, the guidance, like you rightly said, from the PS, especially PS Treasury in a public institution. Now, I want you to look at these two worlds where government actually provides goods and services um, to, 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 to the public. The private sector lives and survives on bottom line. Bottom line is profit. They do not care whether they, 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 are, they are massive, all they care about is profit. Now, these are two very interesting worlds, and you want to marry them. So what you want is the, the, the person who has a bigger uh, say in this negotiation is the private sector. And you can see he's telling you he, he wants to see what we call a return on investment. He's not going to be a piece to just come and support and get to the, the 10 percent that you promised yet he's actually putting in huge capital expense so that's why i said i'm still struggling to really get to your your research and also to understand how this will be entrenched because these are two different worlds what i expected to to see is how you are unlocking the issue of the legal framework at the PPP Act and how this can actually make it easier for private organizations or companies to come in, get their objective, which is really to get their return on investment, as well the public schools, which you say, getting the infrastructure, because infrastructure is really the need. If you talk about um, adopting uh, a school, that is not going to solve the, the, the issues in PPP. And I think you also mentioned something else in terms of how the university can also partner. So I would want to really see more concrete outcomes. So far I'm struggling, sorry to say, and I really want more guidance from, from your end. Let the, um, the issue of CP, private public partnerships. Uh, we are focusing on public schools. Maybe you need to define to us what you mean because uh, if it is basic education, basic education, the government provides everything. Except we know that the building has been built on a random. But no school is allowed to charge uh, in any way because I'm just coming from this point that the universities can charge fees to or can uh, very students who can be accommodated at a fee so you are able to raise the fee to pay the private sector. In the context of a framework of public secondary school, how is that? You want to suggest to them that this can we introduce this model to create more classrooms? Uh, given that these facilities are being provided for free by the government, so to me, I think that is something you want to to see whether you are using the what we know, the, the, the practice, and what is the implication, because we introduce this, what they mentioned in a public primary and uh, maybe private school, that's different, because 
you can work well. Maybe you want to set with private schools because they can um, they can build and stay those who are willing to stay. But public schools, uh, it's possibly. Maybe the final question now, then we'll answer them before we break for lunch. Thank you so much. Uh, Bison, keep up the good work, although it's work in progress, as he said. Work is not complete. My concern was on the legal framework that allows uh, private public partnership to an extent. Uh, and the private partners are allowed to invest in the public goods. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, members. Now, most of these questions, they are not questions, they are, you are giving me an insight on what I can go and do out there. Because as I said, it is work on progress. Now, I was asked about whether the church would they engage in uh, uh, these uh, school matters, whether it is a part of the social responsibility or business. Uh, this private, part, for example, when I mentioned the schools, because there are some schools that, uh, uh, that are founded on uh, Christian principles and started by these church organizations. What happens is that most of these schools, actually I can tell you most of the schools in this county, especially the schools that have existed for a number of years, for many, many years, they were all started by the church. So you will see there's that element of the church and the government, because the government just came and uh, because this, uh, the history of these uh, schools is that they were started by the church, run by the church for some time, and then the government took them as a public. Why? Because the lands built on this were mostly donated by the community. The community donated to church, the church, the church develops the infrastructure to serve to a certain extent and then the government took over. And this, this, this is still a partnership. It's a kind of a partnership. And I gave two examples in Meru of schools that run. They are public schools, but in, in, in the primary school. They are primary public schools, but they are run uh, the, 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 the church that runs them, manages them as the bond, changes fees to these students. So you can see there's, there's, that, that's a partnership, and it's a partnership that is doing well. And I gave that example and showed you that there are the best schools in Meru, the two of them. Uh, I mean, this one is the best in this sub county, and I gave an example of another one, which is in South Yemen, but which is the best, and most of the time it is the best in the country public school. So I want you to think about that. What has made it? Uh, why, why has it happened? Or why, why are they run that way and they, they do very well? It's because of that cooperation that is there. The government supports. It gives uh, 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 the teachers to teach in these schools and uh, other computations. I don't know whether the primary gets a lot, but those monies are channeled there. But at the same time, the church provides the boarding facilities, and um, a few other things, and then the schools run, and they run very well. So this is the, the thing that I would, uh, I've wanted us to think about for secondary schools. Why? Because, I, as uh, I've mentioned, the, the case of Tiganya West schools is deplorable. I wish I could bring the images here of the schools, the deplorable state, most of them, and uh, as I have, have, have indicated to you, most of these schools lack partnership. It's only four schools, that have been supported by NGOs uh, to drill water and then the arid areas of this uh, sub-county to attract the students. So even the students are not willing to come to these schools because of some of this problem. The schools that are partnered with the private sector, they are doing well, and that's that's the that's point. So, but you see, we can make it, uh, we can extend this, uh, um, this partnership so that, uh, and the best way to, part, uh, to extend the partnership is to look for private uh, parties that are willing to partner with the public. I'll tell you about, uh, just somebody mentioned about justification. Justification uh, is because you, when, when, we, when you, I gave you the performance of the schools, 
uh, of this in this account, the secondary schools performance uh, again it is not very, very it's not really good there are very few students that are being taken to school to and that's the justification enough the other one is uh, how about this uh, system now that is changing from primary school to secondary school we are expecting a large number of students that are joining secondary school, but these schools do not have even if the infrastructure. So what I'm going to do to our students, there couldn't be a lot of wastage or students, uh, pupils who may not be able to join the secondary school. So this is uh, something that can be uh, that can be explored to ensure that we are able to accommodate these students when they join secondary school and they are able to get quality education. Now. Uh, I did mention uh, Banaramar, I didn't mention prisons anywhere. Maybe you did not hear well. I'm only concentrating on schools. Now, uh, our chair of the council committee, you talked about uh, infrastructure development and you said it's the main thing that schools uh, want, these schools, and it is true. The, it is the infrastructure that they want. And you wondered now, now that the, the PPP Act, which is uh, uh, managed through the Treasury, but it does not allow devolved, devolved uh, PPP arrangement. And this is the question as a researcher I'm asking. If uh, we devolved in governments from the central government and we have around 47 governments, isn't it also possible to recommend to the government that it is important to devolve this? Because we have seen uh, locally when making these arrangements it is working. It is developing schools, it is developing schools. When NGOs, for example, come in and adopt a school, because that's why I also mentioned something about adoption as part of uh, developing these schools or improving the quality. When they, the NGOs come and adopt a school, surely we see very, very different results in these schools. And this is what we would like to, that's the kind of change we would like to have in uh, schools all over this uh, uh, sub county. Now, uh, we also need to, I also need to give an example of uh, an, uh, a, a PPP that exists quietly between the board of management, boards of management in secondary schools, and uh, the financiers. Now, most of, of these schools have uh, transport, school buses. These school buses is a, is, should be a project of the parents. In most of these schools, we do not, the parents do not, are not able to raise money or finances to finance the transport, the, the, those buses. What they usually do is they make an arrangement with a private financial, either a banking institution or the motor vehicle, those who deal, deal with the selling motor vehicles. And the, the, the motor vehicle is delivered to the school, with, and it's a contract that is done. The motor vehicle is delivered, and as schools, as pupils, because it is, again, I said it is financed by parents, when the schools, every term, there is an amount that you're supposed to deliver or to pay and the payment is done in several terms. So that's a, another kind of a private public uh, engagement. As I said, public private engagement is in very, very many forms in the world over those examples that I've seen in the world. So, and, and uh, for the university, because you also mentioned the university, it has also worked very, very well. You remember the, the Kenyatta University housing scheme, uh, accommodation for students, they did it quite well. I don't know whether they were able to repay. There are some other universities of late that have been engaging the government, I mean, uh, engaging the private sector uh, over the same student accommodation, and they have done that. I've seen SECU, I think uh, EMBU or Machakos, they have done that. So this thing is going on, and it can be done in secondary school. If you go to these secondary schools, especially those, the few that, that I said are in extra county. Okay, those schools, where there is a lot of congestion, this is another thing that can solve the problem. Because there's uh, too much congestion in schools, in big schools in this country. And, uh, uh, okay, yes, Chair. Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to inform you that uh, at one time I was uh, I worked in the Ministry of Education. Mm. I was the district inspector of schools. I worked in the Ministry of the Office. According to the government books, all schools, public schools, that is a basic education, are day schools. And those who are which are boarding, they are considered in the back, the books of the government to be private boarding. 
That's how it's defined. That's why the government capitation calls for tuition and teaching. Okay. When you want to start a boarding wing, mm. that is private. The government cannot give boarding because you may want a smart and yet that's what I think. So any investment that goes Maybe boarding, that's where you may. I'm just giving it some idea that mm. there is something that the government has committed. That's why you see the money given to schools. I don't know how it is defined, but I think it's for students. A student tuition, hmm? upkeep, and books and stationery. Hmm? So anything that is in those areas, even classroom, I think that. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. It is true. It is true. Uh, they, they. But you don't you think, Chair, that is also partnership? No, no, the, yeah, the, the, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a very thank good Thank you, thank you Dr. Kubaison. I need us to stop here because in the interest of time, so we can be able to proceed. Over lunch hour, we can continue to interact with him with more questions. Thank you, participants, for being very patient and keen to listen. We wish to break for lunch and then we'll resume to listen to the other four presenters. Six presenters. So we have six presentations. So we would like to encourage the presenters who are going to be presenting the afternoon, please stick to the time so that the rest of the other presenters can have time to present. So Sante Nisana, we can break for lunch and then we just re regroup again. How many minutes? Th 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, TVC says we come back at exactly three. So we can do it, thank you.